and gentlemen, the Honourable Robert French. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter. I feel like I'm being recycled. Uh, I'm giving a, uh, the Anthony Mason lecture in Melbourne at the end of the uh, this week uh, again for the second time. So <laughs> it's uh, it's good to be uh, to be asked uh, back. Um, Chief Justice uh, Martin, uh, President of the Law Society, uh, the Dean of uh, Murdoch Law School, Your Honours, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I knew uh, Sir Ronald or Ron, as he insisted on being called uh, by everyone. I knew him when he was Solicitor General of Western Australia and after he became the first Western Australian to be appointed to the High Court. He was a strong Federalist, he was protective of the position of states in the Federation and he was conservative in his approach to the interpretation of the Constitution. He had a commitment to social justice and as Peter mentioned he uh, 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 gave strong personal support in the early 1970s to the formation of the Aboriginal Legal Service and many years later after his retirement from the High Court became the President of the uh, Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission and in that capacity co-author of what is uh, known as the Stolen Generation Report. He also had a long-standing commitment to higher education, serving as Chancellor of Murdoch University for many years and being instrumental in the foundation of Perth's second law school at that university. And it's fitting that the university is a sponsor of this evening's event and that the Dean is present. He would, I think, be pleased to be remembered by the continuation of this lecture series. He would also be pleased to know that a substantial part of the audience consists of Year 12 students, part of the rising generation whose understanding of the working of our representative democracy is essential to its good health. So tonight I want to say something about the function of courts in maintaining the rule of law and legal limits on official power, which are essential elements of our representative democracy. And in that context, I'm going to offer some observations about a phenomenon loosely called populism, which allegedly in the name of, quote, the people, unquote, or some section of them, sometimes calls into question the legitimacy of the courts and other societal institutions. We can all observe that planet Earth is shrinking. Its uh, physical smallness is more apparent every time we look out into our solar or uh, extrasolar and extragalactic surrounds. I was struck by the fact recently uh, observed that a single centuries-old cyclonic storm on Jupiter called the Great Red Spot, recently observed close up by the NASA probe Juno, is 1.3 times as wide as Earth. And that you can fit 1,300 Earths into Jupiter, which after all is just another planet in our rather small and pedestrian solar system. Our planet is shrinking in another sense. Electronic connectivity, convergent and conflicting political, social and economic interactions, international and domestic economic inequalities, the unprecedented impacts of the human species on the environment, large-scale movements of people displaced across national borders by war, civil conflict, drought and famine, transnational crime and terrorism. These things have humans rubbing up against each other and their world to an extent we've never before experienced in world history. And that metaphorical shrinkage is stressing nations and institutions in the democratic world and elsewhere. And sometimes it leads to acute discontent with governments and institutions and political systems which are not seen to be dealing effectively with the stressors. There's a class of social and political expression of that discontent described by the word populism which has been in the news in the last few, uh, last few years. Broadly speaking, it refers to approaches to public discourse which seek to denigrate and bypass allegedly underperforming societal institutions and associated elites. It's an international phenomenon. A report by the Secretary General of the Council of Europe, which was published in May this year, entitled State of Democracy, Human Rights and the Rule of Law, focused on the topic populism. How strong are Europe's checks and balances? And in that report, the Secretary General of the Council of Europe noted that after the Second World War, Europe's nations had worked to build constitutional parliamentary systems protecting individuals and minorities from arbitrary power. They had come to understand that democracy was, by definition, pluralist, and that giving citizens the right to be different and to criticise authority 
made their countries more stable, not less. He went on to say, however, in this report, today, however, many of our societies appear less protective of their pluralism and more accepting of populism. By populist, he said, I mean those political forces which appeal to widespread public grievances while seeking to exclude other voices. We should be precise. Populism is not a catch-all label for every person or movement which rocks the establishment. Misusing the term will only render it meaningless. Rather, it describes those who invoke the proclaimed will of the people in order to stifle opposition and dismantle checks and balances which stand in their way. He expressed most concern about governments openly challenging constitutional constraints and disregarding international obligations to human rights and added, attempts are made to justify such actions on the basis that they serve the majority population. Those who oppose are discredited and undermined, including political opponents, journalists and judges. Now, as indicated in that report and in much other recent literature about populism, its practitioners typically claim to represent or speak for, quote, the people, unquote, or, quote, the real people, unquote. Now, a recent example was seen in the language of the British politician Nigel Farage, who campaigned for the United Kingdom to leave the European Union and claimed the Brexit vote as a victory for real people. Now, that class of person did not apparently include the 48% who voted the other way. A similar theme ran through President Trump's campaign and was reflected in his inauguration speech when he said, today, we are not merely transferring power from one administration to another, we are transferring power from Washington DC and giving it back to you, the American people. The term populism, I should be clear, has been used to describe approaches taken by political leaders and commentators from right to left, across the spectrum of political beliefs and ideologies. So speaking of Bernie Sanders, the so-called left-wing candidate for the Democratic presidential nomination in 2016, former President Bill Clinton spoke of negative populism and positive populism, and called Sanders a much more positive populist than Donald Trump. <laughs> There's been quite a lot written about populism recently. In a book entitled, What is Populism, which has just come out, Jan Werner Muller, a professor of uh, politics at Princeton University, uh, said of it that the core claim of populism <coughs> is that only some of the people are really the people. Of course, it's not unusual for politicians to invoke what they call the real people from time to time. Now, while this may be populist language, it does not necessarily reflect thoroughgoing populism in the more general sense that I have described. In Australia, we hear references from time to time to, quote, real Australians who are contrasted with elites who sip lattes or chardonnay, depending, I suppose, on the time of day, and who live in leafy, expensive inner city suburbs. When President Obama visited Australia in 2011, he came to Canberra and then flew to Darwin, saying, no doubt upon advice, that he was going to meet some, quote, real Aussies, unquote. And that leads to the question, if the real Aussies live in Darwin, who are the other 24 million people or so who live in the rest of the country? And if we extend the class and say that real Aussies live in rural areas, who are the more than 80% of the population who live in the cities? The use of this type of language by some politicians and some public commentators, who are paradoxically themselves well within any definition of elites, is classic wedge rhetoric. There is economic and social inequality in this country, and there are layers of disadvantage. There are respectable and competing arguments about how best to respond to that inequality and disadvantage. There are significant economic challenges facing Australia, and respectable but competing arguments about how to respond to them. The same is true of the great environmental challenges of our time, so far as they affect Australia. And there is also a diversity of social, of attitudes on social and cultural questions. It adds no credibility to the competing arguments about any of those things to try to shore them up by dividing Australians into real Australians and elites or any other subclasses such as, quote, rich or, quote, ordinary Australians, leaners or lifters. Populism, in the sense I've described it, is a phenomenon of our time which is not quickly going away. 
it feeds readily into a hyper-adversarial political process. It's nevertheless appropriate to point it out for what it offers. Rhetoric and words identifying false social diseases, false remedies and false hope. We can call it snake oil from the desert fringes of our civil and political discourse. Now populism and populist language is directed from time to time at courts. It can be used to reflect impatience or anger with courts, particularly in two settings. The first is in connection with the sentencing of criminal offenders. The second, which is the focus of this lecture, is relevant to the judicial review functions of the courts when they determine the limits of legislative and executive powers, and particularly where the decisions of courts hinder elected governments from doing what they want to do, even to the extent in some cases of holding that a law passed by a democratically elected parliament is invalid. The Secretary General of the Council of Europe in the report I mentioned earlier made the point that impartial and independent judiciaries are the means by which powerful interests are restrained according to the laws of the land. They guarantee that all individuals, irrespective of their backgrounds, are treated equally before those laws. Such judiciaries he described as an obstruction to populism because of their refusal to bow to political whims as well as their willingness to assert the rule of law against political agendas which would otherwise trample it. He said it should therefore come as no surprise that undermining the judiciary is on page one of the populist playbook. The populist response to decisions hindering political action is to blame the courts. Either the system is declared defunct or individual judges are portrayed as out of touch, self-serving or even corrupt. Such criticisms then pave the way for political acts which circumvent the established legal order and for reforms which weaken judicial authority and enable greater political influence. And we've seen some recent examples of that, I think, in Europe, Eastern Europe. It's not unusual for Australian critics of court decisions in judicial review of executive or legislative action to refer to judges as unelected, thereby suggesting that they lack a democratic legitimacy which is enjoyed by members of parliament and ministers of the Crown who are responsible to the parliament. And in some cases, unelected judges are said to be frustrating the will of the people. Now, a recent high-profile example from the United Kingdom occurred when the High Court there, three judges of the High Court of Judicature, ruled that the United Kingdom government could not simply rely upon the referendum decision to leave the European Union. It had to get the authority of the United Kingdom Parliament. The Daily Mail newspaper on the 4th of uh, November 2016 ran a story on its front page saying that the court's decision was in defiance of the 17.4 million people who had voted for Brexit at the referendum. The headline under photographs of the three judges who had made the decision read, enemies of the people. It reflected the degree of debasement of popular newspaper culture in the United Kingdom and it was also profoundly silly. The judges had not decided the Brexit question for themselves. They had said the law required that even though there had been a referendum, Parliament must make the final decision by enacting a law authorising the exit. And that judgment was upheld on appeal to the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. The newspaper headline reflected what might, in the terms I've already discussed, be called a populist approach with its use of the word people, even though the people it referred to were 17.4 million out of a total UK population of 55 million. They were nevertheless a majority of those who voted. The courts in Australia, as in the United Kingdom and other representatives, give effect to the rule of law which is indispensable to the proper functioning of, the, uh, of our democracies. Like all human institutions, they have weaknesses, they make mistakes and they may be criticised for their decisions and process, processes. However, criticism is one thing, populist abuse is another. The decision of a court can be criticised for its reasoning, for its application of the law, for its treatment of the evidence, for the choices that the court makes in the way it interprets the law or the constitution or implications that it draws from the constitution. These are common criticisms and they are fully to be expected uh, in a uh, healthy representative democracy. But some kinds of criticism don't rise much above expletive-laden uh, uh, expressions of approval.
There are colourful examples in Australian legal history, including the use of the word pissants by a Member of Parliament to describe the justices of the High Court who decided the Wick People's case in 1996, and the term blockheads by another Member of Parliament to describe the justices after an extradition decision in which I participated. Uh, that kind of language can be dismissed as part of the colour and movement of Australian civil and political discourse. It doesn't cause the courts or anyone else to lose much sleep worrying about the future of democracy. But a recent and perhaps more troubling example from beyond our shores was the reaction of President Trump of the United States to a decision of a federal judge, Judge Robart, who had issued a temporary restraining order against the implementation of the President's first immigration banning order. Um, the judge was a conservative Republican appointment. He issued this temporary restraining order on the application of the state governments of Washington and Minnesota who were challenging the federal government's or the federal, the president's decision. This was an example of a court exercising a judicial review of executive action, that is the action of the president, in a dispute in that case between federal and state governments. Judicial review of executive action, I should say, is also, uh, for the benefit of the students, an important part of the responsibility of Australian courts at both federal and state levels, and I'm going to focus on that in a minute. In explaining what he was doing, Judge Robard, in giving his decision about why he was exercised, why he was issuing this temporary uh, injunction against the President's order, was careful to set out the limits of his judicial function. He said this, the work of the court is not to create policy or judge the wisdom of any particular policy promoted by the other two branches. That is the work of the legislative and executive branches and of the citizens of this country who ultimately exercise democratic control over those branches. The work of the judiciary and of this court is limited to ensuring that the actions taken by the other two branches comport with our country's laws and more importantly our constitution. Now his description of the function of the courts in the judicial review of government action would be regarded as an entirely fair and accurate description of the function of Australian courts in judicial review of administrative action. In fact, Sir Gerard Brennan, the former Chief Justice of the High Court, said something very similar in a much quoted judgment uh, back in 1990. But despite the uncontroversial explanation by Judge Robart of what he was doing, it seems to have been news to President Trump. In a comment tweeted at midnight uh, on the day after the uh, decision was made, the President said uh, the opinion of this so-called judge, which essentially takes law enforcement away from our country, is ridiculous and will be overruled. Now, that statement was not what you would call a reasoned criticism of the judge's decision. And it was troubling because it was expressed as a denigration of the judge and his judicial authority, carrying the implication that his decision was somehow undemocratic. That kind of denigration from a political leader, whether in the United States or Australia, will not, of course, deter any judge or court worthy of the name from carrying out its function. Nevertheless, it can be seen as calculated to undermine public respect for the rule of law by calling into question the legitimacy of a key institution that supports it. In that sense, it undermines respect for a fundamental part of our societal infrastructure. Now, judges are not daffodils, to quote a term recently used by a West Australian senator, but the courts as institutions are relatively fragile. They do not have the power of the executive at their disposal. They depend upon public confidence and the support of both the legislature and the executive for their effectiveness. Now the most effective protection against the pernicious effects of populist rhetoric is the work of the courts themselves, expressing in that work their independence, their impartiality, their competence and their efficiency, and affirming in every decision which they make the rule of law. Protection will not be found in laws which punish populist rhetoric. Indeed, in Australia, some such laws could fall foul of the implied freedom of political communication, which the High Court found in 1992. That incidentally arose out of an article uh, which appeared in that year, I think, in the Australian newspaper, highly critical of the Industrial Relations Commission of Australia. This article said, uh, commenting upon a decision of the Commission, the right to work has been taken away from ordinary Australian workers, 
Their work is regulated by a mass of official controls imposed by a vast bureaucracy in the Ministry of Labor and enforced by a corrupt and compliant, quote, judiciary, unquote, in the official Soviet-style arbitration commission. A measured observation, you might think. Now, the newspaper was prosecuted for a breach of Section 299 of the Industrial Relations Act of the Commonwealth, which provided that a person shall not, by writing or speech, use words calculated to bring a member of the Industrial Relations Commission or the Commission into disrepute. Well, the High Court held the section to be invalid, and three of its members held that it infringed an implied freedom of political communication derived from the text and structure of our Constitution relating to representative democracy and its provision for the election of parliamentary represented by the people who had to be able to talk about political things in order to properly make decisions. Now the content and application of that implied freedom has been developed in a number of cases which followed over the years. An important long-term strategy against populist attacks calculated to undermine the courts, in addition to that which I've already mentioned, namely the performance of the courts themselves, is to promote the widest possible understanding in the Australian community of the important features of our representative democracy and particularly the idea of, our, of a government which is responsible to the parliament, of independent courts and of a rule of law which governs private action and public power. And against that background I want to make, say something briefly about the rule of law. It's a term whose uh, uh, meaning is much debated and the subject of extensive academic literature, but a core element of it is that nobody, private citizen, public official, judge or government, is above the law. A famous English judge, the late Lord Thomas Bingham, uh, wrote a book about it in 2010 in which he explained the rule of law as follows. All persons and authorities within the state, whether public or private, should be bound by and entitled to the benefit of laws publicly made, taking effect generally in the future and publicly administered in the courts. And that formulation fits into the Australian legal order. Under our Commonwealth Constitution, with its division of lawmaking power between the Commonwealth and the states, they have the different uh, areas of uh, responsibility, the limits it imposes on those powers and its separation of the judicial from the legislative and executive branches of government, there is no such thing as unlimited official power. An important provision of the Constitution, Section 75.5, which I won't read out uh, because it's somewhat technical language, has the effect of conferring jurisdictional authority, if you like, on the High Court to hear cases in which the decisions or conduct of Commonwealth ministers and officers is challenged, where the challenge is on the basis that they have exceeded their constitutional or statutory powers or have refused to carry out obligations imposed on them by law. And there's a similar authority conferred by statute on the Federal Court. Chief Justice Gleeson described this provision, section 75.5 of the Constitution, as providing a basic guarantee of the rule of law. Because it's a constitutional provision, it cannot be taken away by anything other than a constitutional amendment which would require a referendum of the Australian people. It follows that Commonwealth executive action cannot be immunised against legal challenge and scrutiny for lawfulness in the courts. And the High Court has implied from the Constitution a similar protection in relation to the Supreme Courts of the states. Their power to review the decisions of state officials um, for uh, what's called jurisdictional error or exceeding power um, uh, cannot uh, be taken away. Moreover, the Supreme Courts can't be abolished. The High Court has also held that the courts of the states cannot be made subject to the direction of the executive governments of the states. And neither they nor federal courts can have imposed on them or their judges functions which are incompatible with the essential characteristics of courts. And amongst those essential characteristics of courts are generally open hearings, procedural fairness, which I'll mention in a little while, and publicly available reasoned decisions. So there is, to the extent which I have described, a pervasive constitutional protection for the rule of law across state and federal jurisdictions in Australia in relation to the exercise of official power, which enables its limits to be policed and enforced on the application of persons who are affected by its exercise. 
The legal system, of course, embraces far more than laws about the extent of official power. It covers a huge array of acts of parliament, regulations, bylaws and rules made under acts, and policies for their implementation, which cover a very large range of topics. It also includes the common law, which is the judge-made law developed case by case over many years. That deals with the rights and liabilities of people in relation to such things as contracts, property, employment relations, the duties and responsibilities of people towards each other, including duties of care. There's a large number of Acts of Parliament, of course, which have modified or in some cases abrogated or added to the common law. But the common law still plays a very fundamental role in our legal system. The rule of law covering uh, the uh, whole of the legal system in relation to both private and public action, as I have uh, described, provides what I call a kind of societal infrastructure for our representative democracy. It creates and maintains the space within which we can enjoy our freedoms, exercise our rights, develop our capacities, find opportunities, take risks and generally pursue life goals and it gives shape and definition to Australia as a particular kind of society in the global community of nations. Now I mentioned that the rule of law involves independent courts which have certain essential characteristics including open hearings, procedural fairness and publicly available and reasoned decisions. And that's a requirement, procedural fairness is a particularly important aspect of the work of the courts. And it's a requirement also which extends to official decision making, not by courts but by public officials. The common law or judge made law generally requires that officials including ministers of the crown when making decisions which are likely to affect the rights, interests, livelihoods or liberties of persons should accord them procedural fairness. It's a term which used to be covered by the words natural justice. This has two important components. One's called the hearing rule. That is that a person likely to be affected by a decision should have an opportunity to be heard before that decision is made. So if one person sues another, a court will not hear the case if the person being sued has not been notified of it or had an opportunity to file a defence to challenge the plaintiff's case and witnesses and to give evidence himself or herself and call his or her, her own witnesses and to put arguments to the court by way of defence. Similarly, in the field of official administrative decision making, not decision making by courts. If a public official, let's take an example, if a public official or authority were to decide to cancel a person's licence to carry on a particular business or occupation because of say some alleged misconduct by that person, the person affected by that decision would have to be given the opportunity to show, if it be the case, that he or she had not committed the misconduct or in any event that it wasn't serious enough to warrant suspension of the professional or business licence. And you can multiply examples of this, this kind of decision making and the application of that rule indefinitely. Now, the second component of procedural fairness is the rule against bias. So it requires that a decision maker not be biased against the person to be affected by the decision, nor that there be even the appearance of bias from the perspective of a reasonable uh, observer. So let's take the licence case again. If a public official had to make a decision about who amongst competing applicants would get a licence to operate the business, and one of the applicants was, say, his spouse or his sister, um, then, uh, even, uh, uh, then it would not be right for him or her to make that decision. Even if the official were able to be actually completely neutral, the appearance of bias from the perspective of a reasonable observer would be such that the official would be prevented from proceeding to make the decision and if it were made and the licence granted to the spouse or partner then that decision could be set aside in the court. So these rules of procedural fairness, the hearing rule and the rule against bias, are common law rules which have been developed by judicial decisions over many years. They're of course subject to parliamentary control and parliament can make laws which narrow the scope of procedural fairness in some classes of action. Uh, attempts to make such law in relation to court uh, processes would be at risk of being un held unconstitutional. Now there are a lot of justifications for procedural fairness in the way that the courts conduct their proceedings and in the standards which they require in that regard from official decision makers. One of the most important uh, justifications is simply this, 
procedural fairness is an aid to good decision making. If a decision maker doesn't hear from an affected party, he or she may not have all information relevant to making the best decision. And if he or she is biased, then the decision may be made for the wrong reasons. Secondly, procedural fairness supports the rule of law by promoting public confidence in official decision making. It also gives due respect to the dignity of individuals and it is democracy's guarantee of the opportunity for all to play their part in the decision making process. Uh, it's perhaps important to add that the common law rules of procedural fairness are not one size fits all rules. They are adapted to the kind and volume of decision making involved. For example, they don't require a personal conversation or a hearing between a decision maker and somebody affected by a decision in every case. It may be done by exchange of correspondence. When you think of very high volume decisions that have to be made by some government departments, then plainly procedural fairness can't involve, um, um, as it were, an oral appearance before the primary decision maker in every case. And in fact, I had a case uh, in which that question was raised many years ago uh, when I was in the federal court. Now that leads me on to say something about the notion of separation of powers and judicial independence, another essential aspect of uh, the character of courts. It's an important feature of our Commonwealth Constitution that our courts exercise judicial power, they don't exercise executive or, law or legislative power. The courts must apply the law. Um, I'm sorry, the other aspect is that the executive and the parliament, of course, don't exercise judicial power. The courts must apply the law, but they can't be directed by the executive government on how to decide particular cases. You can't have the minister ringing up the judge and saying, I think uh, I want uh, this case to be answered in that way. Now, there are some places where that happens. Um, the courts, uh, if that were possible, of course, the executive would end up itself indirectly exercising judicial power. Uh, judicial uh, independence is clearly related to separation of powers. And it's a concept which goes back to uh, uh, an English act, the Act of Settlement in 1701, when judges were given security of tenure, so long as they behave themselves, and the king's power to remove a judge could be exercised only on an address by both houses of parliament. Now the protection for the judges which was affected by the, affected by the Act of Settlement is actually reflected in section 72 of our Commonwealth Constitution in relation to federal judges and similar provisions in various state constitutions. The judges are also protected from reductions in their remuneration during their term of office. That is to say, they can't be punished for decisions of which government disapproves by reducing their pay. That would undermine judicial independence from the executive. Unfortunately, it doesn't work to prevent judges having to pay increased in tax rates if they happen to uh, come along. A separation of the Commonwealth judicial power from legislative and executive powers was established under the Constitution was explained by the High Court in 1956 in a famous case called the Boilermakers case. There's no written expression of the separation of judicial from executive and legislative powers in the state constitutions, but there are conventions and understandings which underpin a degree of political respect for that principle and the independence of the judiciary. A former Chief Justice of South Australia, uh, the late Len King, in a paper on separation of powers given back in 1994 said, the constitutional arrangements which existed in England in the 18th century being the separation of powers resulting from the post-1688 settlement upon which responsible government was engrafted, flowed into the constitutions of the Australian colonies and hence into the constitutions of the present Australian states. And the Commonwealth Constitution, as I've already mentioned, has also been held by the High Court to protect the essential judicial character of state courts, which confers in effect a lot of the protections that one would get from separation of powers and constitutionally guaranteed judicial independence. Now I've spoken up to this point about the limits on the powers of lawmakers and public officials and the role of courts in enforcing those limits. The courts themselves, of course, are confined by constitutional and conventional boundaries on the exercise of their functions. There is no such thing as unlimited official power, whether it be legislative, executive or judicial. Uh, although there is a separation of powers under the Commonwealth Constitution and by convention, there is a kind of limited lawmaking function on the part of the courts. 
the common law is a term which refers in part to principles of law developed by English courts over centuries and inherited by the Australian colonies and developed by Australian courts. And the process of its development is incremental, decision by decision. Canada, New Zealand, the states of the United States of America have also inherited that common law tradition. And I've pointed out that it covers areas like civil wrongs, contract, aspects of the law of property, rules of equity and trusts. When judges consider a change or development of the common law, which involves them in incremental lawmaking, they generally take a conservative approach, conscious of the constitutional boundaries of their function. Too great a change from an established principle may, for example, unsettle existing arrangements that people have made on the strength of their understanding of the settled law. The courts may decide that a change involves such important consequences and a variety of conflicting considerations that it's better left to Parliament. A recent decision we made in the High Court before I left it was on the question whether, and it was really a, a common law process, whether um, uh, the DNA, uh, DNA segments uh, used in the um, uh, diagnosis of um, susceptibility to breast cancer could be patented. And we said to hold that uh, they could be patented involved an extension of the law which uh, attracted a lot of competing policy considerations and was not a matter, not a step we were prepared to take. It was a matter best left to the uh, Parliament. Uh, sometimes a significant change to the common law by the courts can lead to the judges being accused of going too far, of doing something which should have been left to the Parliament. And then the judges may be accused of something called judicial activism. Uh, <coughs> This, by the way, was an expression invented by a journalist, uh, Arthur Schlesinger, in 1947 in an edition of Fortune magazine when he coined the phrase, or coined the term to describe a certain set of the Supreme Court judges of the US as judicial activists, and the other bunch were called champions of restraint. <laughs> the High Court's decision in the Mabo case that the common law could recognise Aboriginal native title, namely interests in land and waters derived from traditional law and custom, generated great controversy, and that was because of the effect it was said to have on pre-existing understandings of the law of property in Australia. And uh, Peter mentioned earlier that I was appointed as president of the National Native Title Tribunal in 1994, a post I held until 1998, and there was a lot of tension about the uncertain implications of that decision and how it was all going to work out. And we were trying to work uh, up a mission statement as we were required to do by Commonwealth bureaucrats for the uh, Native Title Tribunal and I remember suggesting that our mission statement was to make Native Title boring uh, <laughs> and I think I succeeded. <coughs> <laughs> Much discussion of judicial activism is really a discussion about separation of legislative, executive and judicial power and the reciprocal uh, restraints that accompany that separation. In the Australian context, the separation of judicial power from the other branches of government has constitutional underpinning, but it's not always defined by bright lines. The restraint by the judges and by the other branches of government is in part a matter of convention and mutual respect which cannot be written down. Activism is a term which is sometimes applied as an element of what we might call populist rhetoric to label decisions with which somebody disagrees. It's not a particularly useful word. It is, however, always meaningful to ask whether a judge has exceeded or stayed within his or her proper function, whether they've gone beyond it by creating rules outside the permitted interstitial lawmaking necessary to decide the matter before the court. The question may properly be asked in the context of judicial review of executive action, whether a judge or court has uh, not just uh, determined the lawfulness of executive action which is under challenge, but decided to substitute its own view of what is the correct or preferable decision. The question may also be asked whether a judge or a court has applied to the task of interpreting the constitution or a statute principles generally regarded as accepted or legitimate, and if not, why they've been departed from. Each of those questions raises a different kind of legitimate inquiry. Their sharpness is lost and the seriousness of the debate about the judicial function which they raise is compromised if they are swept up under the almost meaningless term judicial activism. In conclusion, the courts are indispensable to the rule of law in our society. The rule of law is indispensable to the enjoyment of our rights and freedoms 
and uh, the democratic process under which elected parliaments make the law and the executive parliament responsible to the courts carry, to the parliament carries it out and the courts determine its meaning and application in disputed cases. There will always be debates about what the courts do, whether they are doing it well and whether they've kept to their proper constitutional function. Informed debate about such matters is a sign of a healthy democracy. That health is not enhanced by the use of populist rhetoric. The courts and our democracy are too important for that. Thanks.